Welcome back to Austin P. State University's Theater Appreciation course. We are moving right along to the last chapter in this unit, which is acting. So we're going to talk about what is an actor, what skills they need to have, um, what training, and uh, some of the methodologies for being a good actor. So first let's just talk about what people think acting is, right? Um, there's a lot of preconceived notions. Uh, he talks about on page 148 how people think that acting is so glamorous and you get to be the center of attention and people, um, once you're famous, fawn all over you. But the ugly side of acting we'll get to later on in the lecture, which is auditioning. A lot of actors work paycheck to paycheck, contract to contract. If they don't have a steady gig, uh, they can most of my friends who are full-time actors are on some kind of unemployment for most of the year because it's a very rigorous and competitive business. That uh, one in the bottom corner there, what I really do is wait by the phone. So much of acting is waiting for other people. Um, waiting for other people to offer you jobs, waiting for other people to um, provide space for you or get back with you after an audition. So. Um, acting can be glamorous for a small minority, but for most of us who played the acting game, um, it's a lot of rejection. And then when you do win, it's still hard work when you get the job. Um, it's not all uh, roses and curtain calls and after parties. There's quite a bit of um, good old fashioned hard work involved in being a good actor. So that's me there. Um, there are lots of ways to be trained as an actor. There are those actors who are not trained at all. Um, and some of them are very good. They just have good instinct. Cameron Diaz, uh, she's one of many. Um, but then there are others who have got training. Uh, so what I have is a Master's of Fine Art. That's um, three years of graduate school. It is considered a terminal degree. There's not a doctorate in acting. So it is a terminal degree in its area. Um, you can see there are five of us there. Those were the only people in my class. We became very close working together, um, training together, doing scene work together. Uh, and that is a theater performance degree. So um, there are BFAs, uh, undergraduate degrees, or BAs in theater. Um, those are also very valuable and more and more BFAs are becoming very, very specialized. So if you want to do musical theater and you get a BFA in musical theater, they're going to give you really advanced classes and you may not need to go on and get an MFA. My undergraduate degree was in theater and speech, so I felt, felt like I still had some growing to do before I was ready to face the professional world. So, um, Some things that we focused on, there are three basic areas for any actor in their instrument, which is their body. Um, dancing, singing, and interpreting. So um, obviously in musical theater this is to an even bigger extent, but um, most actors have their strength. Um, mine is interpreting. Um, I do have a pretty, uh, you know, I grew up taking dance lessons and I'm certified in several weapons. I have a pretty good um, physical and my voice is very strong, but I've never been a huge singer. So I know my strengths and I know my weaknesses. I would never um, audition to be the lead in a musical just because I know that's not my strength. A triple threat is someone who can do all three really, really well. So let's break this down a little bit. Um, so you may have recognized um, Bill Irwin there in the picture. Uh, he plays Mr. Wiggles, uh, but he's a wonderful comedic actor, physical comedy. He's kind of like Kramer on Seinfeld. Uh, great slapstick comedy. You guys know where the word slapstick comes from? Um, in Commedia dell'arte they had a wooden stick that the would create the sound effect of someone being beaten or hit and it was a, a stick with another stick jointed on it and you could kind of uh, slap it together and it would sound like someone was getting hit so um, in in combat situations often a slave being beaten by his master so 
that's where the term slapstick comes from. But slapstick takes a lot of work. Um, but the number one reason why we train our bodies is relaxation. If you've ever had to give a speech or do a scene or perform in any way, you've probably felt the tension that it creates in your body. So training yourself to relax is the first step. Relax your shoulders, relax your body, and that doesn't mean you're not going to get nervous, but um, often the enemy of realism and authentic performance is rigid shoulders, braced knees, tense back, um, you know, those posture problems that happen when you're tense. So um, a lot of actors spend a good part of their beginning training learning uh, yoga or relaxation techniques that help them take over control of their body and not be controlled by their tension. Um, obviously, uh, a lot of plays have scenes with dancing in them, even if they're straight plays. Uh, so a lot of actors, to a certain extent, um, learn to dance. And then obviously stage combat is going to be a part of any actor training, but especially on the advanced level. Um, so it may not be a big deal to pretend one time to go through a battle scene, but if you can imagine a repertory theater where you may do the same show eight times or nine times a week, falling that same way every night, you really have to be um, strong and know how to the techniques for falling correctly in order for that not to really damage your body. So. Um, some people really specialize in stage combat. Um, that's really who they are and what they do, and they end up playing the same roles over and over again um, because there are some roles that just require more combat than others, um, particularly in Shakespeare shows with uh, swords and such. Uh, so all of this is part of an actor's training in combat. <laughs> this is a uh, the Broadway version of Sister Act. You may have seen that movie before and I always love that scene with the sweet little red head and then she um, finds her voice and can sing all the way to the back of the room. Um, training the voice is really surprisingly emotional. It's psychological. Your voice is one of the first things to tell on you emotionally. Um, once again, relaxation. If you're not careful, um, you can uh, cause tension in your voice when you're strained or when you're tired. So first, just learning to breathe. Learning to breathe deep breaths and making sure that you're supporting your voice enough. Those of you who've been in choirs, you understand this concept that you have enough voice to support your projection because one of the main uh, issues in a theater space is being heard in the back of the room. If they can't hear you, then they can't follow the story. And while some theaters use microphones, not all do. Um, and even then, microphones have to be, uh, it has to be loud enough to, to pick up on the mic. So resonance, having a pleasant um, vi vibrations, being able to hear um, a clear uh, resonant tone, something that people enjoy listening to. Um, so making sure that you have that technique to create dulcet, uh, by that I mean musical quality to your voice that people enjoy listening to. So um, the last thing that I want to just touch on for a moment is dialects. Being able to speak as if you were from a different place. So um, I'm on page 150 and they say here that Meryl Streep is great at dialects. We have what's called the International Phonetic Alphabet. So we translate different words in the way that they sound based on the noises that are in each um, sound. So let me just give you an example. Uh, that's a picture of our Motlow students. As I said, we're doing Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and that is in a British accent. And some of the students are really struggling, really, really struggling. Um, others were in Mousetrap last semester and have done a British accent, uh, and they are already doing well. So hopefully, as we rehearse the scenes enough, they'll start to rub off on each other as they hear the British accent more and more. But as I coach them, here's some of the things that we work on. Isolating sounds, finding those specific sounds that are different. Some words are the same in British English as they are in American English, right? Build, build. It's the same in British as it would be in English. 
but uh, particularly the R's, right? Are there more birds? Are there more birds? Now notice how many different R sounds there are in that and they all kind of sound different in the British accent. Are there more birds? Now, based on how those words are put together in the sentence can even change the sound way one word is pronounced from one sentence to the next. So notice because in this sentence any is after there the, because you have to link those two words together the R is pronounced. Are there any birds? Right? So the arrangement of words. So IPA can get pretty complex um, but it can also be fun learning to talk in a different accent and sort of doing voices. There are entire careers made in voiceover work so are there any birds? Are there any birds? So it's kind of fun. Um, one of the first steps and a lot of my students down here in Tullahoma are having trouble with is de-regionalizing and that was something that I had trouble with at the beginning for example, my name, my first name is Emily, and I'm from Tennessee. Well, at one of my first auditions, I said, my name's Emily, and I'm from Tennessee, right? Because that's something that we in Tennessee tend to take that uh, uh, uh sound and create a e e e. One of the many ways that we have a distinct voice. Um, one that I particularly like is uh, white rice, white rice, right? We sort of elongate those vowel sounds. So as I'm trying to teach the students how to speak a British accent, first I have to try to teach them their own southern accent so that they're aware of it, can kind of de-regionalize and then move into British accent. So that was sort of a little tangent there, but just to show you how applicable it is in the everyday work environment. So I'm going to share with you one of my horror stories. Uh, you see me there in the purple dress. I was uh, in repertory theater. We were doing three shows in cycle. Um, but uh, the first moment of the play, I had to come out and deliver a page long monologue. I had done it several, several times. But uh, one afternoon, matinee, I came out, and for some reasons, the house lights didn't go down. They were supposed to go down before I entered, but they were having trouble in the light booth, and I could see the audience, and for some reason, I lost my concentration, and I could not remember my m opening monologue. Um, and it was horrible. I blanked and kind of muddled around the stage and picked up about three lines in and left. Uh, it was one of the worst feelings I'd ever had in my life and that moment will haunt me. Um, so when we as actors learn to train our minds and concentrate it is to avoid this actor nightmare moment of forgetting your lines on stage. Um, so, what do we do to practice concentration? Um, we uh, play concentration games, which I know sounds kind of weird. I know some of you played them as second graders, but uh, really training your mind to pay attention in the moment. Memorization is the donkey work, the ass work of theater. Just sitting down to memorize lines, there's no easy way to do it, but you have to be a disciplined person, a person who will sit down and memorize those lines. Uh, confidence, right? You have to learn to think positively. Getting myself out there to play Luella Parsons for seven more performances was not easy. Absolutely dreaded stepping back out on that stage and haunted by the idea that I could blank again. Um, on top of that, my character was a really confident character. She was a reporter on that red carpet you see, and so um, I had to overcome my confidence and then boost my confidence even more to play this confident character. And then another thing we have to train our minds for is improvisation. We have to be ready for things to go wrong, and if they do go wrong, we have to be able to improvise into getting back on the story. So we already talked about improvisation, so hopefully you remember uh, that, that context. So the great acting theoretician, theor, theor, uh, theorist, that's the word I was looking for, sorry, uh, is Konstantin Stanislavski. 
Uh, he's Russian. Uh, he's at the turn of the century, right along with Freud and this big movement towards psychology. And let me just say that he really wrote down things that were already going on. Uh, he takes he deserves a lot of the credit for standardizing in these things, but um, not everything that he was saying was a new idea. So the psychological approach to the characters, right? So there were other approaches that were physical. Um, in the French form, uh, we would just pantomime physical movement. So if I have both my palms upreached, um, that is a piteousness. And if I have one hand to the back of my forehead, oh, I'm a female in distress, right? Those uh, Diderot gestures were one way to approach it, but Stanislavski, on the other hand, wanted you to get inside the psychology of the character, psychoanalyze them, understand who they are and what they want, and that creates your approach, right? Get in their head. Um, when America interpreted Stanislavski uh, through the lens of what they were taught, it became what's called the method. A lot of famous actors are perform uh, with the style of the method. In fact, our most famous actors, Meryl Streep, um, it, for one, there's so many. Um, almost all of the 1950s actors who rose to power, Marilyn Monroe, uh, there's lots of them anyway. Um, so Stanislavski challenged his actors to be ensemble, to work as a group. He wanted everyone to have an equal number of lines rather than having Hamlet and Hamlet or Macbeth and Macbeth. He picked plays by Anton Chekhov that had lots of stars, lots of performers, all kind of sharing the load. Um, he focused a lot on realism, which we'll talk about more when we get into genres, but uh, he wanted people to act natural. Right, he would have people smoking on stage. Uh, he would have people, um, you know, if you had an itch, scratch it, which was different than the sort of presentational methods before. Like I said, Diderot had people hitting exact poses. People would kind of walk to the front of the stage and uh, deliver their monologue uh, with all of the precision of a dance routine. This was much more relaxed, people yawning, people, um, you know, moving around the stage in a way that would feel maybe a little melodramatic to our modern audiences, but still much more naturalistic, none of this um, posing when you're on stage. So what happened uh, is that Stanislavski's methods were Russian, and when he came popular, um, in the 1920s, uh, the group theater, Stella Adler, Lee Strasberg, um, a lot of those um, original group members, they formed a compound. They all uh, supported each other and lived in the same house. And it was considered what many people would call a commune, which is associated with communism. Um, so Elia Kazan and some other members attended um, communist meetings. Now, uh, communism at that time was closely allied with a lot of clubs. So, for example, um, the union, the actors' union, there were a lot of communists in that. Um, and it, it didn't have the same stigma or understanding that many people uh, have today. It wasn't quite so clear-cut. Um, and so what happened in this theater compound is some people were attending these communist meetings and then when we had um, the House of Un-American Activities Committee come around in Hollywood and blacklist people. Blacklisting was something that we did in America. Uh, you may have heard of McCarthyism. Are you now or have you ever been part of the Communist Party? Uh, that movement. Um, some of the group theater members were considered communist and then blacklisted from Hollywood. In fact, Elia Kazan was one of the group members who named names. And when he accepted his award um, at an Academy Award ceremony, many people didn't stand um, because they felt like he was in some way a sellout. He was uh, accusing other people so that he could remain successful. So that's sort of the, some of the darker sides of American politics and, um, and some of how the group theater had kind of a mixed uh, history.
But like I said, many of the best American actors, Dustin Hoffman, Christopher Walken, Gene Wilder, Al Pacino, these guys are all studying the method as given by the group theater, as interpreted by the group theater. Stella Adler, a uh, very famous acting teacher. So you may be asking yourself, so what? Um, I would say, and Shakespeare would say, that all the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. At some point in your life, you may have to act a little bit. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that you should be fake or a poser, but there are times when you're going to have to put up a stiff, up, stiff upper lip. You're going to have to um, get it together and fake your way through momentary adversity. Um, one example that I might think of is the boardroom. Right, A lot of women avoid going into politics because it's a complete faux pas to show emotional weakness. And, and uh, some of us women are more susceptible to tears in a moment's notice. But you kind of need to be able sometimes to work through the moment. And um, so as I go through some of these methodologies, you may want to try it. You may want to try deregionalizing your accent. You may want to try um, improving your mood through physical action. So... Um, the first sort of trick that we as actors use is a Stanislavski method, and it's called psychological gesture. And this has to do with the physiology of your body. Your body language affects your mood, and your mood affects your body language. So if I am walking down the hall, and I have my shoulder slumped, and my head is looking at the ground, and I'm walking very slowly, then I'm probably in a bad mood and I'm probably through that physical posture only perpetuating that mood right whereas if I stand up straight and I try to smile at people there's a chance that just changing my physicality could actually physically improve my mood if um, there's a scene where I have to work up and get anxious then maybe I just wring my hands and that physical act of wringing my hands will actually create anxiety in my body right the same is true with my fists if I ball up my fists in anger and I grit my teeth I can actually create tension in my body but if you feel yourself starting to ball up your fists and it's not an appropriate time for you to be angry try releasing your hands and taking deep breaths your body is is only acting on your mind and your mind is only an expression of your body sometimes we in academia are tempted to think of ourselves as sort of floating heads or just a brain with a package but our body contributes to our physicality and the way that we feel so I'd like to challenge you if you're having a bad day next time you're having a bad day just try faking it till you make it try standing up tall smiling at a few people and see if that doesn't make you feel a little bit better so emotional memory so and, uh, once again um, if you're trying to create an emotion one of the best ways to do that is to remember a physical environment so for example you may associate a certain smell with a person right so um, if I want to work up tears for example I may just think of my sister, visualize my sister crying, right, and think of the smells that I associate with my sister, right, the type of shampoo she used to wash her hair with, and then that will help me to create an emotion. Some of you may know this with an ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend, um, their smell or their song comes on, you ha your body has a physical reaction. Once again, because of the physiology of our bodies. Now this is a very controversial method, this Stanislavski method of emotional memory. Because in some cases, in most cases, actors are trying to work up tears. And they're actually sort of inciting a sense of PTSD. They're thinking of a horrible event in their life and they're reliving living it over and over in order to create that um, emotional intensity. So the problem with that is that it could be sort of uh, raping your own psychology in order to create this memory um, can do long-term damage, which is one of the speculations about why so many actors uh, abuse so many substances. 
uh, or it is a short-lived uh, I'm sure you may have heard some of that around uh, the Joker when he uh, committed suicide some people said that it was because he was trying to kind of create those intense emotions every night and uh, it was just emotionally too draining for him so um, but Emotional memory can be used to a positive extent. If your grandmother always cooked cookies and that was a happy memory for you, get a candle that smells like those cookies and there's a good chance that may perkin up your mood. Or when you're having a bad day, think about a pleasant place where you've been and the smells and the sights and the surroundings of it. Visualize yourself on that beach. Visualize yourself hiking through that forest. Relive those happy moments and it can help affect your mood. So um, the magic if is an acting technique once again by Stanislavski and uh, he is talking about psychologically how do you create empathy for the character right your ability to understand and identify that other person's situation how can you sort of put yourself in their shoes and sometimes actors are challenged to play these really despicable characters right we have to play uh, the devil for example and Dustin Hoffman famously said there's a devil and a Jesus inside of all of us and we just have to remember like t at what point would we perform the actions that this person is doing um, would we ever get to the point where we would kill somebody so you just have to ask yourself what do I and this character have in common what if I lived a thousand years ago what if I as a woman had no rights what if this man abused me every night so you kind of take that if 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 and push it imaginatively all the way to the point that you can genuinely identify with your character another trick of uh, the imagination is substitution once again it's a little bit controversial but if I'm supposed to be talking to a man on stage and I am yelling at him but I care about him I might think of an ex-boyfriend I might imagine that I'm talking to that ex-boyfriend and I'm more likely to show genuine emotion right uh, when I was in my undergrad right after right before I came in a guy had played an abused character on stage and he had been pretending like it was his father who was actually abusive so once again there's an extent to which this can psychologically damage someone right you can sort of incite the post-traumatic uh, stress another substitution is situations so on page 157 um, is it 157 yeah uh, there's uh, an anecdote about an actor who was standing on stage with a gun to their head and uh, in absolute panic-stricken terror and silence for a minute and when the director asked him what he was thinking about to create such genuine emotion he was thinking about stepping into a cold shower and he just hated cold showers um, and as silly as that may seem there are situations that create physical emotions for us and if we can imagine those situations sometimes they're more compelling or more uh, emotionally charged than the situation in the script so actors have to keep their imaginations fresh they have to find ways to really step into the character and live that world and become part of the scene so I'm gonna kind of glaze through page 158 and 159 because we'll go back for your next paper that's due for your final exam and talk about characterization but I will say a few terms here the given circumstances most of you have remember this from English class what's the age what kind of culture are they living in what's their religion class political view um, what are the given circumstances of the play and that's something um, every actor needs to be well versed in history or be willing to research uh, because stories always happen in a context and it's always going to affect the interpretation so the other question is super objective what's my motivation what do I want right what does the actor truly want from life and from this what's the driving thing that governs their behavior right um, I thought it was interesting that your book says Stanislavski said that Hamlet wanted to find God That's an interesting interpretation most people would say that Hamlet wants to know 
if his father has killed uh, his stepfather his uncle has killed his father and that's kind of his driving force it's basically a murder mystery uh, so uh, what is your super objective what do you really want throughout the play and uh, finding that motivation you can once again charge the character and then the motivation from moment to moment right how do you act around one character based on a different character do you want to flirt with them do you want them to think you're important do you want to humble yourself and uh, and make that person feel better right we all have motivations they're not all selfish but we all have a motivation you have a motivation uh, in what you have on right now right the clothes I have on right now my motivation is to be comfortable <laughs> but some of you uh, may wear a certain pair of jeans to impress somebody or you may wear a shirt in order to appear uh, more masculine or more cool right we all have motivations and they affect our daily behaviors so anyway I'm gonna move kind of past that uh, page 159 but I will come back to it in the next lecture so here is the for many people the harder side of theater which is getting the job a good audition feels great let me just say that when you nail an audition there is nothing like it theater is a competitive business and knowing that you did well is a great rush but for most of us it's a very intimidating situation in many cases you have two minutes you may drive across town take three buses but you still only have two minutes you got dressed up you're wearing high heels but two minutes is all you have on that stage in front of those directors and part of that is because equity actors equity it requires that everyone be able to get a chance and so because they can't t lower the playing field they have to give everybody a chance they can only give us a couple minutes to prove ourselves so if it's a singing audition it's usually only 15 bars if it's just a um, acting audition many times what we do is pick two contrasting monologues so if the theater does classical and modern work I may do a Shakespeare monologue and a Sarah rule monologue if the play theater is all edgy sort of cutting edge I may do a comic monologue and then a more serious one and then um, for dancers there's usually a dancing callback once again only about a minute of dancing for you to prove yourself so if you're interested in getting a theater job, I'd love to talk more to you about that. There are classified ads. There are ads in newspapers such as the Nashville scene. Um, you can get an agent uh, depending on what kind of work you want, particularly if you want to be in television and radio. Um, agents are very helpful. But in our modern age with so many options out there, um, I don't always think an agent is necessary unless you're in a really big city or working in a competitive market. Um, best luck I've had has been at the Southeastern Theater Conference so if you're interested in auditioning look at SCTC.org and Straw Hat is for the Northeast same basic thing it's a cattle call audition which is one of your words here on page 164 cattle call means that it's an open call and they bus a lot of people through so I was number 164, right? That just gives you an idea. Uh, you know, three days of auditions. Um, so cattle call is when uh, an open call of an audition where actors are given, you know, just a couple minutes and walked through. I'm sure with American Idol and all of these things on television you kind of have a new idea that maybe older generations didn't about how competitive performing can be but just to give you an idea 900 auditioners 16 can you imagine being the person trying to decide oh my goodness so <laughs> that was when I was in Kafka's Metamorphosis there with the uh, <laughs> this isn't what the rehearsal process does to you or anything the frizzy hair and the uh, gaunt makeup it was it was for the part itself but rehearsing can be part of the hard work I was talking to at the beginning um, it's not like people just step out on stage and are magically genius and the words just slip in their head it takes a lot of work and day-to-day -to -day toil to get a play up to the standard of performance 
Um, the first thing we do is table work. We sit around a table, that's why it's called table work, and we talk about what's the motivation of the characters. The director gives us some style points. Um, sometimes the costumer comes in and pitches the costumes or the set to us. A set model is brought in. And then we do a reading. Uh, a few readings, cast reading aloud, which is very exciting time to sort of get inspiration. And then we start what's called blocking, right? The basic movements of the actor on stage. Where do they enter? Do they stand to the left of the chair, to the right of the chair? And where do they exit kind of thing? And so blocking rehearsals um, sound uh, a lot like giving directions, right? Enter stage left, come center stage, walk back on this line, and then exit stage right. So blocking rehearsals. And right now as we're working on Alice in Wonderland, this is the process we're in right now, which is particularly fun because there are so many animals, like a cat or um, a bunny rabbit. So how do they move? And my initial ideas of where they move on what line are kind of changed by what choices, physical choices, the actors are making. It's kind of an exciting time in a script to sort of block it out. And then after they've blocked the work for the director, it's the actor's turn to really get their most out of rehearsal, which is getting off book, memorizing your lines. In fact, we have one of these rehearsals on Monday, and I'm very nervous because I saw a lot of books in people's hands last class. So I'll let you know how that went. But um, memorizing lines can happen just from doing it in rehearsal and hearing it out loud. A good director will give an actor enough rehearsals of hearing it out loud to sort of get it into their body a little bit more. But then once I said, as I said before, it's just a matter of sitting down and doing the grunt work of memorizing the lines. It can be really exhausting. And so then um, after we have off book rehearsals, we start just running the show over and over. The actors uh, get notes from the director about what's working and what isn't working. The director's job is to just sort of be their mirror, kind of help them along in the process and tweak things. Um, but the run-throughs also create what's called muscle memory for the actors so that when they get nervous they've done it enough times that they can sort of um, get through it even if they're sort of not as concentrated or focused as they want to be. Their muscle memory kind of takes over. Those of you who've done um, dance you may have be familiar with this. You've done the routine enough so that you're on stage and you're not even thinking about the dance, but you're able to go through the motions of it. Those of you who did uh, football and they ran plays, right, the the director, I mean the <laughs> the coach sort of walked you through those plays over and over again so that they were in your body enough so that they just became automatic for you when you get on stick on the field, you run the play without even thinking about, okay, do I run left or right? You've done it so many times, it's in your body. So um, that's one reason run-throughs are so important for actors. A technical rehearsal is when we start to add lights and sounds and cues, um, and that uh, is a long process, but it really is helpful for the director. And then dress rehearsals is when they get in their costumes and start feeling it out on stage. So. Um, as we mentioned before, the actors are supposed to wear sort of costumes that help them in rehearsal kind of feel what it's like to gonna be to move in their costume. So they wear um, skirts if they have to wear skirts on stage in the final performance, that kind of thing. But dress rehearsal is always a new and fresh insight into the character. So that's kind of the process. Um, <laughs> After saying all of this about all the training I did and Stanislavski and emotional recall, I just have to step back to a certain extent and say that acting is can be very simplistic. It can be just saying your lines and not tripping over the furniture, right? And as I got later on into my um, acting, you know, it's very technical and just learning the technicalities of it and, uh, you know, knowing where to put the pause, what beat, what emphasis to put on what syllables. Um, 
I don't mean to sound like it's some magical, charismatic, ex- emotional, uh, you know, religious experience. It can also just be doing your job and <laughs> walking through the park. So um, I hope that this has been a nice little glance into the art of acting. I hope my enthusiasm came through. Even though acting is difficult, it is also a boatload of fun, which is why so many people dedicate their life to it uh, or their hobby, their pastime to to doing this fun thing called acting. So um, congratulations on finishing your second unit. Go away and take that exam and we will pick up with acting in the next unit to talk about your next paper. Thank you for listening.